So to begin, I'm going to introduce all tight uh, Tom Smith. He's going to present about his company. Let's give him a round of applause. Well, first of all, I'd like to say thanks to Ted and everybody with the One Million Cups uh, for putting this together and organizing it. It's really a neat community, and I'm honored to be a part of it. So thank you very much. I wanted to go through the story of Altite. We're calling it the uh, startup versus the entrepreneur. A lot of people think that a startup, you start and you kind of go like this, and you grow and you grow and you grow, and that's the end of the story. What I'm wanting to explain to you guys today is that it doesn't always work like that. So I started up all tight in 2003 in my garage with a cell phone, pickup truck, called my brother. He joined the team. We started going, and what we did was we were a focused company on bolting. A lot of you guys might not know what that is. When you have two pressure pipes that come together, they can either be welded or bolted. We do bolted ones. That's it. So there's hydraulic torque wrench like the one pictured here is a really important part of our product mix and we started to sell these wrenches and rent them and fix them and repair them and we started growing by being hardworking, innovative and scrappy. Scrappy is kind of a theme that I like. I think it means quick on your feet and resourceful and able to put things together. I've been scrappy for most of my career. I wasn't born with a whole lot of uh, like a family business or anything. So I started off, uh, the first time I was scrappy is I was in the brass buckle and I was trying to sell Z Cab Ricci's. <laughs> I said, you know, they only send us two size 32s, so you better get those on layaway. <laughs> layaway scrappy. <laughs> but you can see here, um, this is what our product mix was starting in 2003, kind of going through the first nine years or so, um, heavy on tools and equipment. Um, moving a lot of product out, and you can see uh, calibrations, repair, and rental were kind of an auxiliary or kind of a smaller part of our business. As things started to go, you can see that we expanded our footprint across multiple different states. Um, at one point, we had presence in 19 states, two countries. Um, but right here in little old Wichita, we only were 6% of our business. We hardly did any business in Wichita. So it was a Wichita homegrown business. I mean, I went to East High and KU, um, but we didn't do much business here. So we had a, we had a nice little thing going, you know, start up and then it kind of grows. Uh, we had a business in wind, petrochemical, um, fertilizer plants. But the biggest amount of growth that we had was in um, oil and gas development and the fracking boom that you guys may have heard about and the uh, advanced horizontal drilling and the onshore shale market in the US was was really a big booster of growth. We grew over 30% a year for three straight years and almost doubled the size of our company until we get to November 27th, 2014. I don't know if you guys remember that day, but it was a Friday, it's after Thanksgiving. <laughs> It was a day when a bunch of oil ministers from OPEC got together and decided collectively that instead of restricting production to balance the world's supply and demand of oil, they were going to go ahead and flood the world markets with uh, crude oil, thus doing the great oil bust of 2015. Well, when oil field service companies stop CapEx, it's a really fancy way of saying they stop buying from Altite immediately. <laughs> um, so from this date till the end of uh, January, three months, we lost 60% of our business like that, 60%. So as the wise poet philosopher Mike Tyson said, <laughs> everybody has a great plan until they get punched in the face. Altite got punched in the face on November 27th. Here's the graph of the world oil market. Uh, you can see the graph here. There's kind of a little bullseye around November 27th and the price just tanked and tanked and tanked and we had inventory piling up and orders being canceled left and right and we didn't really know what we were gonna do. So this entrepreneurial business that we had 
all of a sudden got turned back into a startup pretty quick. Um, so we had to pivot and change what we were doing. These are the three things that we did. We cut hard, we cut fast, and we cut deep. We had to retract out of markets, let a lot of people go. It was really sad. Um, we just had to do whatever we had to do to try to keep the lights on because we were literally bleeding all over the place. But what we did, it, it also gave us some pause and it gave us the opportunity to look at, you know, what, what do we do well? Um, what type of services do we provide that, um, that really works? And with the help of some really uh, bright people that work for me, like uh, Greg Dunsmore, who you guys see back in the back, uh, we identified that we had a lot of uh, things to offer for calibrations that we weren't currently doing. So we expanded our capabilities and we pivoted our entire company, modeling our mobile service leverage with the software solutions that we provide. And what we found out is it was a transformational solution what we had created in the energy industry was a brilliant solution for aerospace, aviation, manufacturing, transportation. And so we found out that if people with oil don't have any money, the people that burn oil actually will have money. <laughs> so we're not bolting anymore. Now we're a calibrations company. You can see how tools flipped from 80% of our business to 11% of our business in 18 months. So. Calibration is kind of like tuning a piano. All tools require calibration. Um, our approach is, is different by going on site using our software and basically gave us an opportunity to go back to the basics. We diversified our customer base, replaced lower margin sales with higher margin sales, focused on business with residual year over year revenue. Things have stabilized and now we're back to a growth plan. We've got a new focus, we're moving forward, and we're hoping to become an entrepreneurial company again soon. So thank you. Thank you, Tom. Good job. Thank you, Tom. Uh, if we can everybody kind of move over a little bit. We saw people trying to get in. Everybody wants to hear Tom and his amazing story. Obviously, he's overfilling the room. Um, we're going to do a question and answer real quick. Um, if you have a question, please raise your hand maybe before the last answer is, or last question is answered. And Tom, take it away. Okay. Yes. So first, congratulations on the pivot. Um, and second, I'm sure you're thinking ahead to what's next. So are there other potential uses of this technology or other things that you're going to do in adjacent markets? Yeah. Um, Thanks for your question. Um, one thing that we found out is that the software that we'd been using to run our own business is really useful for other people's business, especially the new industries that we discovered. They do some of their own calibrations in-house and then augment with third-party vendors. So we're actually taking our software and with the help uh, from Enovar, I don't know if Ryan or Kenton's here, but um, we're going to be spinning off our software and creating a software as a service company as kind of a, a new spin-off business, um, selling our cloud-based calibration software. So that's one area that we're really excited about. The other area of expansion that we're uh, moving towards is internationally. I've been to Mexico um, quite a bit recently, and uh, we're looking at four labs in Mexico. and. I've been in conversations with some Polish partners about putting um, our concept in Europe. Hey, Tom. Yeah. So who is your competition with the software play, and, and how do you differentiate yourself? Um, in terms of the software, uh, most of the software that's available for the calibration world is a premise-based software. We're kind of on the cutting edge with a cloud-based solution. Um, so. That's the biggest differentiator. And what it does is it allows for both customers that have multiple plants inside of their system to have the software able without any type of an install. The other thing that the, uh, that the cloud base does is labs that have multiple fixed or mobile labs can be tied together on a common platform without having to install the, the software. So, the biggest differentiator at this point is the cloud-based um, deal, but it also gives us the ability to do things like QR-enabled um, calibration stickers that you can retract certificates from your smartphones. So, Tom. yeah. Tom, how about? Oh, you give me the mic, Mike. 
Tell them about how you uh, distinguished yourself as a small company by getting the certification. Oh, well, one of the first things that we did to to differentiate our company was um, to become accredited. Now, the hydraulic torque wrenches that you saw in the picture earlier, not getting too technical, there was no international standard for the calibration of hydraulic torque wrenches. So we actually had to write the international standard, get that approved, then get accredited to the standard that we wrote. Um, so it was, so we had to do inner inner laboratory proficiency testing within our own laboratories. Um, but that really distinguished us. Well, it also gave us an advantage because the second company that tried to become accredited for hydraulic wrench calibration had to use us for proficiency testing. And man, we were expensive. <laughs> Real expensive. And slow. There's all kinds of major chemical manufacturers, high pressure reactor systems in the United States. Is that one of the markets that you're trying to get into, like Dow Chem Chemical, Union Carbide? Uh, there's tremendous uh, opportunities. I assume you're looking into that. Yeah, thank, thank you for that. Um, that's actually one of our biggest growth areas. Um, places that take petroleum as a feedstock and then make other chemicals with it are actually doing very well on the margin right now. So there's a lot of expansion and construction in the uh, chemical industries outside of petroleum refineries. So that, that's a huge, uh, huge growing market for us. Any other questions? With the, uh, you know, with the election coming up, there may be a change in administration that would be more favorable to like pipeline builds, things like that. Are you guys in a position to gear up for that? Should that happen? Yes. As a matter of fact, we um, one of our best customers is the contractor that was awarded a big section of the Keystone XL pipeline. We've been waiting eight years for that to get uh, to get passed because it'll be a pretty nice contract for us. So there's 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 a lot of projects on hold. There's been a lot of uh, there, there's been a lot of delay in a lot of different things, so hopefully we'll start to see some movement, you know, whichever way it goes. What will happen to your company if oil continues to recover? Well, um, that would be nice. Um, <laughs> well, we, fi we figured out how to rapidly expand in that marketplace, and I think that we could duplicate our efforts pretty quickly. So. If, uh, if that did happen, um, we would probably not say no to any orders, but we probably would also not invest and have the company so focused on one thing. Any other questions? Hold on, I'll come over there, Bob. How many employees do you have? At our height, we were at 76. Um, but then after the crash, we got down as low as 38, and we're back up to about 50, mid-50s now. I have one more question for you. Uh, as a startup or you know, a successful company, for those of us in the room that are starting up, mm -hmm. what would you advise us to do in our planning, and how would you, you know, counsel us or, or tell us what to do to make sure that we don't face the types of things that you did? The only absolute uncertainty I can give you about a plan is that the plan's going to be wrong. <laughs> um, so really scrappy, I go back to that. I mean, you have, to, you have to be scrappy. You have to understand that, you know, if you plan to do X, Y, and Z, that can change immediately. And you just have to be resourceful and open to market. But you always see, I, I, what we do is we always try to seek where we can create value for our customers. And sometimes it's not what you intended it to be, so. Uh, yes, Tom, do you have engineering on staff presently, and do you do any customer-specific engineering application for your tools? Um, not for the tools so much, but the application of the tools. We have an engineered software system called iTight. Again, it's a cloud-based software as a service, uh, and what you do with that is you type in all the parameters of any bolted flange joint connection, and it calculates 
the bolt load based on the three limiting factors of flange gasket and, uh, and bolt material and then puts it onto a procedure that an assembler can take into the field and, and put, the put, the, uh, put the flange together. Yeah, I'm just curious. Uh, you said 70 employees down to 30 and now up to 50. I imagine you don't have someone on site uh, for the application of the, the hydraulic wrench for each job. What is the training or how do you train uh, those people on the site employed by the oil and gas companies or the energy companies to use the wrench? Well, believe it or not, there's not hydraulic torque wrenches everywhere. It's not something <laughs> really, really well known. So training is a huge part of what we've done. What we've found is that if you start people through a career path where they start in maybe as a customer service rep or inside sales and then make their way through to a local territory rep, then they can move out and create a, uh, a, a site field rep in different part of the country. But we've found it's nearly impossible to get our culture instilled in somebody who comes to us and let's say they come to us and they're from Atlanta and they come for two weeks of training, it's impossible for them to absorb all of the information and be ingrained with our culture. So it's been a, it's been a huge struggle. Um, but we found that kind of starting people and, and growing them through the business and giving them a career path really gets them going in the right direction. My question is related to the last one a little bit. What are some habits for cultivating a scrappy, a scrappy culture in the workplace? Or what, or what, what do you do to um, keep your staff and yourself in a scrappy mindset? We're constantly hiding the coffee pot. <laughs> <laughs> Um, no, I, a lot of it is from telling stories um, and spending time having, um, having new reps spend time with successful tenured reps. Um, it's just kind, kind of the, the culture. Every, every week at our, at our sales meeting, we have, uh, we have a, an opportunity for one person to give a case study or a particularly unique situation that we used scrappiness or resourcefulness to, to deliver value in an unexpected way. So we try to communicate those as well as we can. Uh, two questions. Number one, how do you power the wrench? Is it like electric or diesel? And number two, how exactly did you get from blue jeans to bolts? <laughs> did you tell that already? No. Uh, um, all right. So first part of the question. Um, it's powered however you'd like, sir. You just need to tell me what your application is. I'd be happy to get somebody to give you a demonstration. Um, we're non-denominational. We will sell to anybody. Um, no, but we have hydraulic, pneumatic, and electric powered wrenches. We also have manual powered wrenches. Um, and depending on the circumstance of the application, it's, it's one of the things that our company does is to help customers understand what options they have and uh, how that's gonna help them out. The second thing, uh, blue jeans to bolting. It's interesting, because uh, my dad was in this industry before me, um, and I always told him I was gonna go to college and get a real job. Um, turns out I went to college and ended up getting the same, same job. So um, it, it's just a matter of, I, I kind of I didn't intend for it to happen, but um, my first job was a independent sales rep and I, I ended up being kind of good at it and so I just stuck with it. I was going to go to law school and thank goodness it didn't turn out like Mike so. <laughs> questions? There's no more questions. Uh, the last question will be as a community what can we do to help you Tom? I guess um, a, a question that's asked of the community at whole is kind of a tough one to ask because I'm not asking a specific person to do a specific thing, but I guess I would say be open to change, uh, be receptive to the things that are different. Um, people are creatures of habit and people get into a routine and they're constantly doing the same thing. So every day you make a hundred decisions that kind of get in a routine. So. If we're gonna push our city forward, if we're gonna make Wichita the place that's the envy of the country, if we're gonna really move the needle, we need to be receptive to change, we need to embrace our differences, 
drive a different way to work, try a different flavor of toothpaste, talk to a person that you'd never seen before. Um, I think that would help more than anything. Thank you.